Thanks a lot, um, Randy, and you know, thanks to all of you for, for coming. Uh, it's, I had never been to Ottawa, and uh, I had different kinds of ideas what it would be like, um, but it's even nicer than I expected, and part of that may be owed to, to Randy's hospitality, um, uh, but part of that also, you know, we had a little time this morning to look around a little. It was really, um, I'm very impressed. I'm uh, looking forward to coming back already. Um, as Randy said, much of my background is actually in financial governance, so I used to be like a finance kind of buff, sort of like Randy style, less accomplished obviously, but that was my kind of thing. But I moved from there through a accounting specifically, so it became progressively more technical, to accounting for the economy as a whole. And these are the projects that, that Randy was mentioning just now. So there are several projects that started in September and will be going on for six years that basically ask the question why we measure our economies the way we do. Uh, you know, if you want to make that a little more specific, the basic question is, why do we calculate things like GDP, inflation, unemployment, or public deficits the way we do? Right? Because there has been a lot of intellectual contestation about these things, uh, but also we find actually like hands on on the ground variation. Countries continue to calculate these things differently, um, and they also keep adapting these kinds of formulas. For example, if Canada would calculate its unemployment rate the same way the U.S. does. Uh, you know, these are figures from 2000, it would be a percentage point lower than actually is reported in the media. Right? So there are often technical arcane details that make a whole lot of difference, and I want to find out what's going on there. Now, the specific thing that I want to talk about today is something that's sort of like laterally related and is something that, that had been brooding, you know, based in Europe, and the crisis surrounds us all the time in, you know, in the news, but also somebody who studies the political economy of Europe. You know, I've been brooding in my mind, and at some point I decided to like, take it by its horns and try to figure out what was going on. And the issue here is the following. If you open European newspapers these days and hear what politicians have to say and policymakers have to say about what is the number one priority for the European economies and for the European Union, then it's reigniting growth. That is the absolute thing that we need to get done. Before anything else, or any of the other things you want to achieve, you know, get people back into work, you know, do something about trends that have to do with inequality, we need growth. That's the, that's the overarching goal here. And there was intriguing because that is something that's been posited as, you know, like a, a natural, obvious response to the financial crisis. But if you think back a little bit, there was a moment, um, say in 2009, 2010, when people drew exactly the opposite conclusion. They said that this financial crisis, this big economic crisis, you know, was the final proof, as any was needed, that what people consider sort of like neoliberal economic governance was deeply faulted, that this was a crisis that had come out of an excessive obsession with growth, people had been too greedy, it was all about you know, putting things on the market and commodification, and so here finally was the crisis that told us that it was time to move on, to move beyond GDP. Right? So you know, let's stop obsessing, obsessing about growth and all these things and do something else. Right? So people drew very, very different kinds of conclusions from you know, what does the crisis have to tell us about the need or otherwise to, to continue to focus on, on growth. So as I went thinking on about that, I discovered that the European Union actually had started an initiative that was called the Beyond GDP Initiative just before the crisis. And it was, you know, it was a project that, as the title says, tried to move the EU beyond GDP. And so I started to become interested in, in this bigger question, okay, so why, if you have these two opposite conclusions that you could draw, what conclusion was actually drawn? You know, was there a doubling down on this growth obsession or were there serious signs of moving beyond GDP? And as I'll tell you in a minute, I think there is really a lot at stake here in the choices that, I mean, it's true for the rest of the world as well, but also that Europe, that Europe makes in this particular context. And so I started to chronicle that this, the, the life of this particular initiative and also, and that's where it connects to the project that I outlined further, try to understand better how GDP as a very particular figure is part and parcel of the contemporary European recovery politics. Now, it sounds pretty, pretty arcane um, at first, but the more I started digging, and I will share with you in a minute the different kinds of things that I come across, I felt that it was really hardwired into a lot of contemporary European politics. And again, it's important to remember that Europe is not only in an economic crisis, but also continues to be in a deep political crisis that, that is tightly wound up with that. Right? We see right-wing populist political parties and movements continuing to gain across many countries. 
the European Union in the eyes of European citizens in the, is in a crisis that it has never seen before. I mean, there are a lot of Europeans who are extremely disenchanted with Brussels, for right or for wrong. But you know, if there ever was a legitimacy crisis when it comes to European integration, this is it. And it's not clear at all how this will end. You know, somehow there have been always this faith in European politics that you know it's going to be fine. People will kind of like see see the light at the end of the day. I think it's an open question. If this thing really spins out of control, and it might very well, then uh, you know, who knows what the European Union is going to look like 10 years from now, if, if anything at all. Okay. So if, if we focus on, on growth as something that people in Europe these days believe is absolutely essential, it's like the fundament on which we need to move forward here, then dig a little bit and you hit four particular questions that are deep sources of confusion. What actually do we mean by growth? I'll show that people mean very different things when they talk about it. How should we measure growth? What do we think are the sources of growth? And how does growth relate to other policy goals that we have? You know, making people happy, ensuring democratic legitimacy, ensuring that we have an okayish kind of planet for future generations, these sorts of things. Right? And again, like these are how we answer these questions. I will show is not just a question of, of, of semantics, you know, sort of like bubble blowing about growth, this, that, and the other, but it influences the very specific choices that people make. Whether they say we need more infrastructure, yes or no, we need, you know, more energy efficient trains versus let's build new highways. Do we need to invest in education, sustainable energies, yes or no? You know, so this is it's like a very very tangible thing. So in this talk, I'll basically talk about three different, you know, it, it comes in three different blocks. The first one is about addressing these or, you know, or, or talking about these four different questions that I have, you know, kind of like picking apart growth and GDP and how these issues that surface there, again, are not only semantic ones, but actually bear very directly on policy choices that we make these days. Then I'll talk about this Beyond GDP initiative that I mentioned earlier, basically so I chronicle its fate, and that much I'll tell you already is rise and fall. And the third one is talk about the very specific way in which GDP as a number is hardwired into contemporary European politics, in particular in the context of the Stability and Growth Pact and the, and the debt and deficit targets that European, European countries have. Right? And you, so you could say that the overall question that I'm, that, I'm try, that I'm grappling with here is, why is there this potentially destructive fixation on boosting growth in Europe? And why is there so little discussion about the bigger picture here, the potentially detrimental effects that may have, and the very clear policy alternatives that might be on the table. Okay, let's move to the first main part. That's about defining and measuring growth and you know, theorizing it. Now, if you were to ask a number of people, so what, what is economic growth? You know, people would start thinking about it and say, well, it's actually, it's actually not that easy to define what we mean when we say growth. What normally counts as growth is a year-on-year -year increase in the amount of services and material goods that are produced as measured by the price tags that hang on them. Right? Um, but of course, the big question is what is included and what's not included. What counts as production? Right? To give you a few examples, domestic labor, so stuff that we do at our home, you know, cooking dinners, taking care of, of my kids, or you know, mowing my lawn or something, is not included. But as soon as I have somebody else come to my house and cook my dinner and I pay them, you know, 10 bucks an hour for it, you know, they just contribute to, to GDP. Now, domestic services, if you will, so, so household production, depending on the country that you look at, these days accounts for something, if it were traded on the market, between 20 and 40 percent of GDP. Right, so if every meal that Randy cooked um, it was included and we added up all these other things, between 20 and 40 percent of GDP would be added. You know, there's production where stuff is produced, but it doesn't count. Now, the interesting thing there is that commodification has meant that we now trade a lot more stuff than we did in the past. Right? You know, things that, activities that used to take place within the household without any money changing hands have now been outsourced. Again, you know, childcare comes to mind, but also hiring people to mow your lawn, these sorts of things. So part of what has it looked like GDP growth has actually just been a commodification of services that previously didn't go across the market, but just happened inside your own home. Now, it's interesting to see that 
we actually see systematic differences between different countries. Right? I said earlier, if we look at the OECD world, then normally we would say that somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of GDP. Now, in countries that have higher commodification rates, if you will, you know, where, where more of this stuff goes through the market, you know, you'll see that there is a relatively smaller share of production that takes care, that takes place within the households. So, for example, where people have been forced to enter the labor force because the welfare state is relatively thin, and you know, they they got to get that money from somewhere. You know, you find relatively less provision of these kinds of services within the household, but you've got to go to the market to earn money and do it right there. So what that means is that household production tends to be bigger in countries, for example, that have relatively large welfare states because people have a cushion, as it were, that allows them to do stuff at home and not flip burgers in the, in the fast food joint on the corner. Now what that means is that if you look at aggregate production in different countries, there's a systematic bias against countries that allows people to produce stuff within the household and doesn't force them into the labor market, for example. Right? So, so you actually see, you, know, you, you start comparing apples and oranges if you start comparing GDP figures of different kinds of countries. Now, there are other kinds of difficulties. I mean, the list is very long, but I just you know, want to give you three more specific examples because they have a direct bearing of what I'm talking about here. The first one is public services, the stuff that I'm doing right now. You know, I'm, I'm on the government payroll, and it's a big question you know, for, for many countries that would be, say, somewhere between you know, 16 and, and 30 percent, again, varies a little bit, you know, large chunks of public services, think health and education. It shows up in GDP figures, so countries include that, but of course, you know, frequently there is no meaningful price tag on, for example, what we do. You know, tuition fees are often politically set and they don't reflect the price of what's going on. So the way that these services are normally included in GDP figures is that people will simply look at the money that is spent on these services and assume that their market value, as it were, their putative market value is equal to the money that's been spent on them. Of course, when it comes to something like higher education, I mean, that's a super wild and completely arbitrary guess. Many of us would like to argue that our contribution to society actually is much bigger than the money that is spent on the university system. There are other people who feel that it's actually a lot smaller than what's spent, right, because people blow bubbles about politics and stuff, you know, <coughs> without, you know, training people to do anything useful. But in any case, you know, that's obviously a very arbitrary decision that's being made there, and you have similar kinds of arguments about healthcare. So again, like it's, it, it, it's not at all clear what it is that we're measuring here. Financial services, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty drastic one. Again, for many financial services, there is no price tag that's put on there. So, you know, for the transformation function of banks, you know, they take in money and lend it out at a higher interest rate. There's no price tags for doing that. So what they've been doing, scandalously, in adding this to GDP is that they've looked at the profits that accrue in the financial sector and then assuming that there is a normal rate of profit in the financial sector calculated backwards and said, okay, so if you guys have been making this and that amount of profits and you know, your return on, you know, is something like 4% or something, then the value of the services that you must have provided to society is 25 times the profits that you've made. Now, if you think back to the kinds of profits that continue to be made in the financial sector, but certainly were made in the run-up to financial crisis, and how the whole thing collapsed and took any, everything else down with it, that's, of course, a, you know, a scandalous and, in any case, inadequate way of calculating things. Final example are natural resources. Um, you know, definitely a, you know, a big ticket item here in Canada, um, but also in other places, where it continues to be completely unclear how to include those. Normally, if you pull a bell of oil out of the ground or out of tar sands or something, it appears in your statistics as though it had come out of nowhere. You know, it's right there. But the fact that you're actually depleting a stock that's already sitting there, you know, that, that there is a minus side, you know, you know, once you've burned that barrel of oil, you know, something is gone that was there before, that doesn't really show up. But, you know, it's as though the stuff comes out of nowhere. Um, and so, of course, you know, that, that encourages a way of using your natural resources that, that doesn't take into account that you're running down a stock here. Okay? Now, you could actually say, well, you know, if you think about it that way, then this output, um, you know, the, the fact that, that we produce stuff and put them on shelves in, in stores, does that really measure what we're trying to get at when we think about economic growth, right? Because it tends to mean, mean something, something very different. A drastically different alternative approach is that you would treat an economy more like a, a company, ironically, and use something that's called the adjusted net savings approach, so that you look at the, the stock of wealth, including human capital and all sorts of things that a country like Canada has, on the 1st of January 2014, 
and compare that with the stock of wealth that that country has on the 1st of January in 2015. And either you've managed to add to that in one way by educating your own people, you know, or, or by you know, keeping natural resources intact, or actually you have not. Right? You start running down your resources, and that gives you a much better gauge of you know, whether you're sustainable or, or you, you know, you're, you're drawing on a, on a string here and actually running down your resources. Right? But these things don't have traction, but you could say that that is, if you're interested in, in, in the, in the long-term trajectory here, then you know, that would make a whole lot more sense. All I'm trying to say is that GDP, even though it's such a widely touted measure, and year and year change of GDP, of whether our economies grow, it's actually not clear that that makes any sense at all and even gets close to what it is that we're interested in. Now, let's then think about, for a moment, about theories that we have about growth. You know, why do we think economies grow if we still assume for a moment that that makes a whole lot of sense measuring that through GDP? Now, it's important to note in the first instance that when we talk about growth, economic growth, we tend to have like an image in our mind you know, that is, say, about a plant you know, that grows like a tree or something, or maybe certainly like you know, some, some dough that's sitting on the kitchen counter and somewhere like expanding. But it's, you know, it, it's like a homogeneous expansion of, of something, right? And that's, of course, very different than something that would show up exactly the same way in GDP statistics, namely you just discover an offshore oil field or something. Right? It could be that you get economic growth in Ontario, where the different cities that you have here and, and, and the, the urban economies, they're completely stagnant, nothing changes there at all, but it just so happens that somebody stumbles across oil that's sitting somewhere somewhere under the surface, they start pumping that out. You say, wow, you know, we have economic growth in Ontario. And on some level, if you go by the numbers, it is of course true, but that doesn't tell you anything about the dynamism of the Ontario economy. Because all it says is that somebody, you know, started pumping oil out of the ground. Could be that the economy of Ontario for all intents and purposes, you know, something that happens in a city like Ottawa is completely stagnant. There's no dynamism there at all. But, but we tend to lump these things all together in a single number that's called, you know, GDP growth, even though, you know, again, there start comparing apples and oranges. Same thing is true in the financial bubble. If you have a, a large financial center that over, say, a decade manages to attract a lot of money from overseas and that's being turned over and there are all these profits accruing there, then you say, like, wow, you know, we got healthy economic growth here even though what you have is a financial sector that's thriving, but that doesn't tell you anything about, you know, this, the, at least this image that people have in their mind of some kind of like an economic organism that is either, either is healthy or otherwise. So when we think about the question whether growth is actually sort of like stable or self-sustaining or, you know, can you just stick with these biological metaphors, whether it's healthy or not, that's a pretty poor, poor gauge. Which brings us to the question, well, should we really care that much about growth anyway? Or put differently, is there a growth imperative? Do countries actually have to grow? If there is so much wrong, you know, with GDP as a particular measure, and also with the certainly ecological toll that the way that we have grown so far has taken on the planet and also in our societies, uh, also on many people, frankly, you know, because, you know, they ended up in pretty bad jobs, it takes a psychological toll on many people. Is it actually a necessity to keep growing, or should we, you know, could we start worrying, is stop to stop worrying about growth? Should we, for example, start focusing on other kinds of policy goals and say, you know, let's try to make sure that people have adequate work? And, you know, and, and as it were, so like, you know, put growth behind that or, you know, or bracket that for a moment, or that we want to limit inequality or something. So when we ask that question, you know, we, we may want to quickly look at different kinds of strands of economic theory and what they have to say about it. Now, neoclassical economics, mainstream economics, if you will, actually says that, yeah, you could, have, you could have no growth. That's fine. Because growth is effectively a function of technological progress and investment. And so any society could make a, you know, a choice whether it wants to put its money into here and now consumption, or it says it wants to invest it in yet another factory so that you know, we're churning out more stuff the day after tomorrow kind of thing. But, it, but there, there's a choice that societies make whether they you want to grow this much or that, you know, it could grow zero, they could start shrinking if they consume all the stuff, stop investing altogether. But, you know, it's a choice there. Now, interestingly, other traditions of economic theory disagree, right? You know, Marx obviously had, had ideas about growth where he felt, you know, that capitalism was ultimately a self-destructing 
mach machine, and one of the dynamics that he pointed to was you know, that more and more of the wealth accrued to a relatively small <coughs> class of capitalists, and you know, that eventually there would be a chronic shortfall in demand, and somehow you know, that way would stumble over itself, you know, that the rate of profit would continue to go down because of the contradictions built into capitalism. And at least as far as that particular argument went, you know, you know, Keynes, I guess, you know, agreed to some respect, you know, saying, yes, you do have a systematic problem, you know, something that starts coming up cyclically and then becomes more and more endemic to the economy, where we have problems on the demand side of the economy, right? So, you know, we, we, we have to keep injecting money there, otherwise, you know, this machine will eventually stumble because wage shares continue to decline, right? So... Both of them say, well, you know, if you have some kind of a capitalist economy, yes, it does actually have to keep growing if you want to keep capitalism alive, right? So that idea actually isn't, isn't that new, th that there is a growth imperative. And ironically, it isn't people whom we normally portray as defenders of capitalism, but actually you know, the critics who say, no, th this thing has got to keep going, otherwise, otherwise it's, it's got a problem. But there are other reasons as well, you know, more mid-level theory kind of reasons where we may think that actually capitalist economies in a wider sense, like the kind of stuff that we have here and, 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 and in Europe, actually does need growth. One of them focuses on private enterprises. And the basic idea is that to entice private entrepreneurs to keep making investments, you know, so to keep upgrading their factories or just, you know, refurbishing their shops or whatever they do, they need the prospect of profitability in the future. But you want to be reasonably sure before you open your second barber shop that you know, there's going to be a bunch of customers coming into that place. And if your expectation is that overall economic growth is going to be zero, then the net effect of that is going to be that it's going to put off a lot of investment, you know, the way that we see actually now in many low growth or zero growth economies, you know, people stop investing because, you know, nobody's going to buy their stuff. Um, and that, of course, becomes a self-reinforcing dynamic. So what is key here is that there is the impression, the perception, the expectation of growth is necessary to get growth going itself. The second reason is that a lot of this investment is actually pre-financed. You know, it's credit financed through banks. And simply put, because you have a financial sector that takes a cut because it pre-finances this stuff, you know, the overall pie needs to keep growing such that there is always a little bit of surplus that can be channeled to the financial sector and the people who own the assets, ultimately, of the financial sector and still allow enterprises to grow enough to become like, happy and say, well, yeah, this is, you know, situation is rosy enough for us to keep making that investment. But what that means is that if you have a large private sector in your economy, there might be good argument to say that, indeed, we need growth. It's either the thing goes up, or if it doesn't go up, then it goes down. Right? But there isn't sort of like a sweet spot we could just, you know, we can just stop growing and start you know, playing more tennis, you know, taking longer walks, or read longer stories to our kids or something. It's either growth, or you have a problem right there. But as I said, if growth is about dynamism in the economy, then, of course, yearly change... In, in GDP actually is a pretty poor measure because a lot of what goes into GDP, you know, talked about public services earlier, actually isn't at all about people opening yet another bakery shop somewhere on the corner. It's about completely different things. It's about whether the government cuts back spending on universities in Canada or something. You know, if it doesn't, then that shows up in GDP figures, but of course that's a poor gauge on, you know, the, the readiness to invest among bakers and factory owners or something. Right? So, you know, there you can see how the measures that we use and our underlying intuitions as to whether why we want to keep growing are actually at odds there. Now, let's then look at a moment for the question whether growth is even desirable at all. Right? So far we talked about, okay, so there, there may be an imperative there that we need growth. And some people would argue, well, actually there's nothing wrong with that because, you know, there are many good things about growth. The main logic there is that in principle, if you have increases in productivity from one year to the next, the implication is that you need fewer and fewer people to produce the same amount of stuff, right? So if you have no economic growth, the output stays constant. Productivity increases, say one or two percent per year, mean that your labor force, or at least the, the, the hours that need to be worked, keeps on shrinking all the time to produce the same amount of stuff. 
Now, John Maynard Keynes, 80 years ago, said, you know, this is, this is the best news ever, because he had this idea, you know, the economic possibilities of our grandchildren. He was like, well, perfect, you know, that means that we can just, you know, work three hours per day and hang out and socialize the rest of the time. Now, as we know, that hasn't happened at all, and there is a big story there as to, as to why that is. But in societies such as ours, you need to grow to compensate for the labor or work eroding effects of productivity increases. Now, and employment in turn is, you know, many studies have been done about that, you know, it's, it's very important to, if you will, citizen happiness. You know, it, it's, it's continues to be the key source of personal self-worth and, you know, and, and, and satisfaction that, that people have, that they have a job that's a modicum of enjoyable. And what that in turn means is, you know, to have somewhat happy citizens, of course, is crucial for political legitimacy. If you have large swaths of your population who are completely disgruntled and disaffected, you know, that's a recipe for political disaster, you know, take over by pretty nasty kinds of political parties. Which means if you take that all together, you say, yes, we do need to grow because otherwise, you know, eventually also, you know, democracy is being undermined because people get extremely unhappy with the state of affairs. But at the same time, there is also a lot of research has been done that beyond a certain level of material wealth, what we would probably consider like, a, a, you know, a, an, an okay-ish, you know, like common sense, where, you know, you've got a roof over your head and, you know, you're doing okay in your society, increasing material wealth does not increase personal happiness. You know, this is a theme, you know, research has been, has been done for this since the mid-70s, mm -hmm. and, and the results are consistent. Whatever you do, at, beyond a certain level, giving people more material wealth does not make them happier people, right? Turns out, actually, some of you may remember this book, The Spirit Level, that came out six years ago, which made a strong argument at the time that there is a strong negative correlation between um, inequality and, you know, other measures of societal well-being. So as inequality went up, you know, many other facets of, you know, of personal satisfaction and of public life started to go down. You know, there were higher levels of crime, there were lower levels of, of political trust, of interpersonal trust, all sorts of things, right? So that inequality was actually bad news. So the question is, you know, how does inequality then relate to economic growth? And there, there are two different kinds of arguments, right? Some people for a long time have been saying, you know what, many of these policies that have been implemented, say, since the beginning of the 1980s, in the name of boosting economic growth, something that many people would associate with a label neoliberalism, they have actually increased inequality, you know, generated more winner-take-all kinds of politics, and so they have made societies unhappier. Yes, they may have been effective in boosting growth in some, some crooked way, but they have actually made societies and citizens unhappier. They have led to you know, increasing disaffection with politics. In the U.S., where I live right now, you know, more and more people falling out with Washington and you know, that kind of thing. The opposite argument is something that interesting comes out of Thomas Piketty's uh, recent book, Capital in the 21st Century, where he argues, you know, the moment you have low growth, an increasing share of the pie goes to the rich folks. So if, unless you are ready to see inequality increase further and further and further and further, you need a fair bit of, that pie itself needs to keep growing, because otherwise it's, you know, it's a capitalist, so to call, you know, cut a long story short, who keep you know, getting a bigger, bigger share of the pie, and that again leads to inequality, makes people more unhappy. So some people say, well, you know, we actually do need to grow to keep inequality in check. And other people say, no, like, you know, all this growth obsession, that's, that's part of the root of the problem why we have, you know, these polarized or increasingly polarized societies in the first place, right? Finally then, you know, when we ask, is growth even desirable at all? remains a question of ecological sustainability. And this is, again, you know, a theme that, you know, certainly since the Club of Rome published, um, you know, its report, The Limits to Growth, again, roughly 40 years ago, it's been widely debated, but it's been a consistent theme that certainly the, the growth models, you want to call them, that, that are employed around the world these days are ecologically completely unsustainable. Um, you know, the way we produce energy, the way we screw the oceans and everything, I mean, it's, it's it, it's, it's a disaster, you know, let's call it spade a spade. You know, this is, this is not sustainable at all. Now, okay, so if we think from in that perspective, there may be an economic imperative to keep growing, may be built into our system, even though it's not at all clear that from an individual citizen perspective, grow, you know, the net effect of growth is to make for happier, more politically engaged citizens, you know, that, that, that are the fundament of the democratic societies in which we live. 
Now, enter this Beyond GDP initiative that I talked about a little bit at the very beginning. So just before the crisis, in the European Union, a bunch of people who were in the DG, the Director General of the Environment, came together and said, you know what, we want to launch this initiative that's called Beyond GDP. They said, we want to start talking about how we can assess the, you know, the, the, the well-being of European societies, I guess that's, that's a way to think about it, and use metrics, measurable indicators that go beyond just economic growth. We want to talk about things you know, like you know, poverty rates, about youth unemployment, a specific thing, economic sustainability and these things. And it was launched with great fanfare. You know, this was like a progressive thing. It said, okay, we want to move beyond Mon GDP here. And then something very interesting happened. Because as it ended up on the, on the desk of the president of the commission at the time, Barroso that was, and he started talking about with his entourage, at first he was like, yeah, this is great, you know, this new thinking and stuff. And then the crisis kicked in, and they started to change the title. It was the first thing they did. So it was beyond GDP. The thing was very quickly rebranded in GDP and beyond. <laughs> It's a very European, I don't know whether, whether people do this kind of stuff here in Canada, but they, that's, you know, when, how, how, how do Europeans do stuff? You know, this is like somehow, you know, sleight of hand, just, you know, turn the thing around. But already, you know, the, the signal was clear, so this is not about getting beyond GDP, but it's like maybe adding some other stuff. But, you know, let's not get, get rid of, of GDP here. And very quickly, you could see clear political cleavages reemerge. You know, at first, everybody was super excited about this thing, but then the liberals and the conservatives would say, well, but, you know, come to think of a GDP really is the central measure, and that is what it's all about, and it's more about, you know, adding bells and whistles, and the Greens were like, no, you know, this is, this is finally our moment, you know, there's this terrible crisis of capitalism, ferocious animal, and, you know, now we've got to go beyond GDP. And as we went into 2009, 2010, and the European crisis went deeper and deeper, so in debt crisis, all these banks need to be bailed out, that the European Commission really started getting cold feet. You know, by 2011, Barrow also said, well, you know, this is a very interesting initiative, which means, you know, translate that it means, you know, couldn't care less kind of thing. And it was effectively just, you know, put into a drawer and, you know, it was like a little task force in DG environment. So where it was supposed to become this commission broad thing, it was kind of like sized down again. And what's very clear is, you know, if you look at the speeches, but I also talk to people in Brussels, is that to the European Commission, the last thing that they felt they could afford was suggest to anybody and to the business community in particular that they weren't interested in economic growth. Anything that smacked of a growth critique, anything that gave off the vibe like, okay, you know, we got this crisis, we're not growing, but hey, you know, we should be we should be having more fun time with our families anyway, you know. So you know, what's the you know this is you know let, let let's turn vice into a virtue and just you know chillax some more and be fine with this. That's like the last thing that they wanted to do. They said, no, we gotta, we got we to gotta double down. we got to come across as completely committed to boosting economic growth. Anything that smells of a lack of that commitment is, is anathema here. We can't have that. So that initiative was effectively buried. There's still sort of like a little bit. It's, it's like on a, on a back burner. There, you know, reports are coming out. But this being something that is embraced across the European Commission is completely, completely dead. Now, interestingly, the alternative that would have been on the table, something like green growth, for example, something that people have been arguing about for a very long time, wasn't even seriously considered. There's a good argument to be made, you know, that greening our economy actually requires a lot of investment into infrastructure, energy, public transport, you know, energy efficiency of buildings. And there's a lot of work to be done if we want to become a greener economy. It would require a lot of investment, would create a lot of jobs. But certainly in Europe, where I think the ground would otherwise have been relatively fertile for that, it was signed line, and why? Because of austerity. You know, in other countries, there would have been an argument to be made, said, okay, you know, let's, we have some budgetary discretion here, let's, let's do that, and, you know, that becomes like a, a, a good stimulus program. In the specific European context, and I'll get back to that in a minute, that was off the table, and why? Because they said, this is something we can't afford. It's not because maybe ideologically we don't like it, but, you know, this is... Let's not even talk about this. You know, we, we're, we're cutting spending. We're not, we're not boosting it. Okay, which brings me to the third point. What is the European specific aspect of this whole story? Now, if you think back a little bit, and I, I, I talked at the, in the first third of my talk about you know, how GDP statistics in general are, are pretty fishy and, 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 and dubious in what they actually measure. 
If you think back to the 1990s, the United States in particular was performing extremely well if you consider it in their GDP growth rates. And it really was the envy of Europe. You know, there was this strong feeling that, you know, that there was, you know, this was in the, in the run-up to the, you know, this was dot-com bubble privatization, you know, this was Silicon Valley taken off at the time, all of fantastic, you know, Wall Street continuing to, to bubble up. And in Europe, there was this feeling that there was really some kind of stagnation. You know, we needed like a, a boost of modernity here. And European GDP figures compared to the American ones were really key in setting the European minds on what later became the Lisbon Agenda, which meant we need to become more American. That's really what it was. We need, we need more venture capital, we need more capital markets, more stock markets, but also labor markets need to be overhauled, all that sort of thing. And one of the interesting things that they did then, as you know, this is, is that as the single currency was introduced, um, you know, became live virtually in 1999 and then ended up in people's wallets in 2002, GDP as a metric was actually hardwired into the set of rules that governed the euro, the stability and growth pact. Uh, you know, this had been in the making for quite a while in the run-up to introducing the euro. But as part of being a member of the euro, European members or the eurozone member states had to sign up to rules that limited their overall debt pile, public debt pile, and also year-on-year -year budget deficits. Right? And, and the two key figures that came out of this were that year-on-year -year budget deficits could not be larger than 3% of GDP, and that the overall debt pile that you had as a country couldn't really be larger than 60% of GDP. Right? And at least in theory, if you broke those rules and you, know, you didn't really get your act together fairly quickly, then sanctions were to follow. Now, enter the euro crisis. What happened in the euro crisis was that, as you know, the public debt of many countries you know, rose very quickly, mostly because they had to bail out their banking sector, which was effectively insolvent. Right? You know, Greece is a little bit of a specific story, but for most other countries, you know, that is where all of a sudden you see you know, public debt levels shooting up. So it didn't start as a sovereign debt crisis, it was a banking crisis, where sovereigns, for a long story, a host of reasons, took on that debt and then became a sovereign debt crisis. As you also know, depreciation or a sovereign debt default, you know, which would have been options that you could have otherwise employed if you feel that your debt burden gets unsustainable, were not an option in the European context. Right? In earlier days, you know, the Italians, they used to inflate their way you know, out of economic crisis by just making the lira depreciate. That, of course, was no longer an option. So the only way to get rid of this debt people felt that was starting to become threatening was by just reducing it drastically without defaulting on it. And that meant, of course, you know, what has become the European mantra ever since, austerity. Austerity means that you have to run a primary surplus. It means that you know, after you've, you, you kept paying off your debt, you, know, you have to have money left at the end of the day. You need to have a higher revenue than your spending money even after you've paid off, you, know, you know, kept paying off your debt for that year. Now, what that means, of course, is that that hurts growth quite a bit. Why? Because as a government, if you want to achieve that primary surplus, in a context where there is extremely little economic growth, our economy is actually collapsing, that means that you have to slash discretionary spending, so spending that is not about paying back your debt, disproportionately. You've got to you know, shave off 10% or whatever of your public spending, but part of that is already fixed because about paying back the debt, and so you've got to slash you know, in education and health services, all these sorts of things, in order to get your debt-to-GDP ratio you know, back on a healthy track. The thing that happens, though, is that as you start to cut your debt up here, you're also cutting into GDP down here. Because you're cutting health services, you're cutting education services. As I told you earlier, if you cut Randy Germain out of this department because you think he's actually superfluous, you know, so GDP is taking a hit that's equivalent to his salary. Now, I don't know whether he's willing to tell us what that is. Um, but, you know, th that is, you're, you're cutting GDP, so you're cutting... You're trying to cut the numerator up here, but at the same time, you're cutting the denominator as well in order to try to get this ratio in order. But that's, of course, a self-defeating strategy that, that you're pursuing there, so that actually doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Right? So what that means is that 
in the European context, there is the sense that you need very clear rules about how you run this common currency, and everybody has to play by those rules. Otherwise, people could free ride, you know, on on you know, the, on the efforts of others, right there. But that's a that's a specific European dynamic. It's a collective action <coughs> problem, if you will, that you have in the context of the single currency, that gives you gives you a lot less flexibility in terms of crisis to say, okay, you know what, we'll just spend our way out of this. Very late in the game, the European Central Bank has picked up some of the slack, but the quantitative easing that has started now or very recently, obviously you know, way behind the curve compared to other central banks. Um, but you know, so there is a very specific European story of how Europe has hardwired GDP figures, very faulty figures, I would say, into the way it governs itself, in a way that's self-defeating, while at the same time it also continues to be fixated upon engineering economic growth in a way that is totally at odds with broader societal goals. To conclude, if you take all, the, all of these things together, you do find that there is a very dubious, if not nefarious, fixation on growth figures. The mantra that comes out of public policy types continues to be like, you know, before everything else, we need growth. Yes, we want a greener economy, but we can't have that unless we have growth right there. Um, but as I pointed out earlier, that doesn't make any, you know, take a step back and doesn't make any sense at all. The second thing to come out of this is when you ask the question, so is there actually a need for growth? Is there a growth imperative? From the perspective of individual citizens, probably no. From the perspective of the economy as a whole, that continues to run along capitalist principles broadly conceived, potentially yes. There may be an argument to be made there. When finally we think about, okay, so what does that mean for the chance that Europe will somehow be able to sewer its link to this growth obsession, and this GDP obsession, unless there's a complete overhaul in the way that the European economy as a whole is governed? That seems, unfortunately, pretty unlikely. Thanks a lot. Oh, gosh. I've lost my job and <laughs> the EU's toast. Thank you, Daniel. And